you, you know, about a year or so ago when we were beginning to plan this series, this uh, breakfast series, we had two objectives in mind. One really was to enhance and, and strengthen our existing business program on campus, which is already uh, a great program for us. Uh, second, really, to, was to find a meaningful way to reach out to the members of the community and serve different kinds of interests uh, in, in our own backyard. Uh, looking at how many of you turned up at this time of the morning and in this time of the year, uh, looks like we were on the right track. And so I heartily welcome you to campus and, and thank you for uh, being here uh, bright and early in the morning. And secondly, uh, when, uh, when Senator Kerry uh, agreed uh, to, to be with us this morning, that also in turn validated what we had in mind as to what we wanted to do. Uh, again, for the interest of time, I'm going to uh, keep uh, my introduction very brief uh, because most of us know him and his illustrious career. On the way up here, I was asking him which did he find to be a harder job, having served in the Senate and in the governorship for all those years, or running an academic institution? That's like a question. I don't want to know the question, but I won't tell you his answer. <laughs> so, so very quickly, uh, for 12 years prior to becoming president of the New School, Bob Kerry represented the state of Nebraska in the United States Senate, and before that, he served as Nebraska's governor for four years. Bob Kerry is the author of When I Was a Young Man, a memoir published by Hartcourt. He served as a member of the National <coughs> Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, the 9-11 Commission as we have all come to know it, currently leads a five-year writing challenge sponsored by the National Commission on Writing in America's Schools and Colleges, is co-chair with Newt Gingrich of the National Commission for Quality Long-Term Care, and is a member of the advisory board of the United States Government Accountability Office and the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board. We are so pleased to welcome him, so please join me. Well, I, I don't have prepared remarks, so I'm not going to stand there, so uh, uh, I will be Oprah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the answer that I gave uh, was that uh, the, the Senate is a lot more difficult uh, than being university president. Uh, physically, it's a lot more challenging. Uh, it took me, I don't know, six months or so to, to break the habit of, on Friday afternoon, heading to National Airport to fly back uh, to Nebraska for the weekend. Um, uh, and uh, in public life, you very rarely find yourself 100% certain on a, on a contentious <coughs> issue. Uh, there are times when you do, but most of the time it's um, um, some fraction, hopefully over 50%. Um, but there are, there are moments, there are issues where you'll be 51% certain one day and 49% certain the next. And you've got to make a choice uh, and oftentimes have to make a choice uh, with an insufficient amount of information to make that choice. And very often, particularly on national security issues, the choice is between something that's bad and not so bad. It's rare that you get an opportunity uh, to make a choice that's just absolutely wonderful versus absolutely terrible. Um, and uh, especially in the modern age, in the, the current uh, uh, stage of the communication revolution, um, uh, it can be quite deadly when, you're, when you find yourself on the opposite side of uh, somebody who feels very strongly about uh, an issue. Uh, I remember uh, when uh, John Ashcroft, uh, then Attorney General, testified before the 9-11 Commission. Uh, uh, he had a very specific uh, tactic, which was to uh, identify Jamie Grelick's action back in the uh, 1990s as having uh, increased the threat to the United States uh, uh, by writing a memo uh, dealing with the wall between the CIA and the FBI. And before uh, John, who was a friend, uh, John and I served as governors together, uh, before he even began his testimony, um, um, I'm a BlackBerry uh, junkie, I was getting emails on my BlackBerry from people uh, emailing me saying, you blankety blank, no good, so-and-so, how could you possibly support Jamie? I didn't have any idea what, so it was all, then people knew what John was going to say, uh, and they were driving that message out, and it can be quite intimidating. People say, well, you get in politics and you ought to have a tough skin. 
Um, it's hard to, to develop a skin that's sufficiently tough to take uh, uh, you know, fairly insulting statements coming at you in that kind of, uh, with that kind of intensity. So in the, in, the, in the modern age, I've got a tremendous amount of sympathy for people that are having to make decisions, especially in the United States Senate, where the power of U.S. law is so uh, uh, enormous, uh, both here as well as in the rest of the world. There's, there's, there's not a significant problem on the planet that can be, that can be solved without the United States' participation. Uh, and it places a, a rather substantial burden, not just on the voting uh, actions, but also the words that people say. People pay attention. You don't think they are, but they're paying attention to what uh, members of Congress are saying. And um, so that, I, I would say the Senate's a, a, a harder job, although at, as a university president, especially of a private uh, university, um, uh, it's the, I, I came from business before I went into politics, but it's been 20 years since I've had a significant management challenge. And as a university president, especially again a private university where nobody bails you out, um, uh, you, you know, you basically, um, you know, you're, you're, you don't make budget and you got to cut the budget. So uh, uh, it's a it's a very very challenging uh, management responsibility that I enjoy very much. And as is often the case when you're doing something new, at least in my case, I uh, find myself uh, having the most uh, uh, energetic time of, of, of things right after I've discovered something that uh, I believe for a long time turns out not to be true. And um, among the things that I've discovered uh, uh, running a, a private uh, university is the enormity, and it's very little commented on in, in my view. It's, when it's commented on, it's largely commented on in a negative way. The enormity of the uh, of the U.S. Uh, uh, philanthropic uh, effort and uh, the the competitive advantage it gives the United States of America because uh, we're unique in that way. Uh, and I don't know where it comes from. Whether it comes from tithing or uh, if, if, is it a religious instinct? I don't really don't know. Uh, 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 I think it's likely to be that. But there is no other nation on earth that has the kind of uh, philanthropic giving that the United States of America has. Uh, certainly, it's encouraged by the tax code. I would encourage it even more than, than, than it's being done. That's the area that gets the most uh, criticism. Uh, but it, 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 it provides us, uh, not just at the, at, in universities and colleges, it, it, uh, but it, uh, in healthcare and many other areas as well. It provides the United States of America this uh, very large and growing, uh, both here and abroad, uh, civil society that gives uh, both the private sector and the government uh, uh, sort of an intermediate partner uh, to do things that neither can do uh, exceptionally well. Uh, so uh, I would say that, that the thing that I've learned the most on the, on the private side, on the private university side, is the, uh, is the extraordinary generosity of, of people who are willing to write uh, both small and large checks uh, to uh, fund the needs of uh, our little university down in New York City. Uh, uh, I was asked to talk about two things that, I, that I, I know a little bit about, just enough to be dangerous, and. Um, um, I, 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 I fear that uh, I sort of have a little bit of Joe Biden in me, so I don't want to start uh, uh, on this thing and find myself uh, uh, interrupting your lunch. Uh, so the, the, the question I was asked to comment on uh, was the impact of the presidential election on health care and national security. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll give a short answer and then let you all uh, take this thing wherever you want to go with, with questions. Um, um, the, the, the short answer is I think that the, in the, the first category, the health care uh, category, will be in, impacted greatly by uh, the state of the U.S. economy when uh, January 20th rolls around and the president-elect uh, takes their hand off the Bible and becomes the next president of the United States. because. Uh, the economic realities uh, will determine how much money is available, whether, you're on the, whether it's a Republican president will, which, who will tend to try to both use the tax code and encourage the, the, the individual consumer movement, or whether it's a Democrat who will tend to favor more direct spending, uh, either on uh, uh, expansion of Medicare, Medicaid, or uh, in some other fashion. Uh, either case, uh, they're going to be hemmed in uh, even if the economy stays as it, as it currently is, but if the economy were to go into recession, they're going to be hemmed, hemmed in substantially, and they'll find themselves simply not able uh, to fulfill whatever promises, uh, whatever considerable promises uh, that they make in order to secure the nomination and secure the support of the American people. Um, healthcare is an exceptionally difficult problem to solve, and you can really see it in 
uh, several different ways. You can look, I'm co-chair of the Concord Coalition along with Warren Rudman, and you can, if you look at the, the current cost of Medicare and Medicaid, it is by far and away the most vexing federal problem uh, that we have. Uh, the, the, the current promise that's on the table uh, to people who are eligible for both of those programs, and uh, you become eligible for the first by proving that you're uh, over the age of 65 and paid 10 quarters into uh, FICA taxes. Uh, you prove that, you, that you're eligible the second, either uh, by being disabled in some fashion or uh, not only proving that you're poor but promising to stay poor, uh, you become eligible for the Medicaid uh, program. But the promises that are in place, particularly for Medicare, and particularly since we're going to go from 37 million beneficiaries today, the baby boomers have just begun to uh, uh, apply for, for Social Security, having reached the age of 62 this year. Uh, in three years, as that cohort uh, uh, transfers in, into uh, 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 eligibility for Medicare, we'll go from about 35 or 6 uh, million people being eligible to uh, 73 or 4 million. Uh, that'll be eligible, and we'll go from three workers supporting uh, the, the uh, 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 one uh, beneficiary uh, to two workers supporting uh, one beneficiary. Now, if you get Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, that's fine, but you don't get to pick the two that are going to be taxed uh, for your benefit. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion about both uh, Social Security and Medicare. There's a sense that people have paid in, and they're just getting back what they paid in, uh, understanding that it's a that it's a straight transfer program with uh, trust funds in various states of health is not something that is generally distributed uh, throughout the population. So I would say they're going to face an economic reality uh, where um, uh, Medicare and Social Security on an annual basis with no vote by the Congress will increase about $70 billion with no expansion, uh, with about uh, $11 trillion of unfunded liabilities on the books right now. Uh, so they'll find a difficult time, in my view, expanding either of those uh, 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 mandatory programs and find themselves more likely having to come and uh, do something about controlling the growth of that inside of the current budget. And having done that before as a member of Congress, I can tell you that the audience, want, that, that, that the audience hears from both sides, actually, both Republican and Democrat, uh, that uh, they want to get more Americans with high-quality, affordable health care. Well, if you pull apart those words and ask people what they mean by high-quality and affordable, <laughs> Uh, they basically say, you know, I want to go see DeBakey and I don't want to pay anything for it. Uh, uh, and that's approximately what it means. And it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to, to hit that bid, to put it mildly. Uh, so, uh, I, and, and I, not, now with my university hat on, we just had back-to-back 23% increases in our health insurance rates. Uh, uh, and it's a tremendous challenge on the cost side, I can tell you, operating uh, that our little... $260 million business down in the West Village. Uh, uh, I can't always pass those costs on. In fact, one of the things I'm going to announce is the Grinch uh, coming uh, in our first meeting with my deans and officers after the first of the year is we're going to have to put, a, put a, a, a hiring freeze in place just to pay for the health in insurance increase so that I don't have to go to, to, to my uh, students uh, and raise uh, tuition one more time beyond the rate of inflation. Uh, as we've also done the past uh, couple of years as well. So it gets, it gets real in a hurry when you're having to figure out how to pay for it. If you're operating either a business or a not-for-profit, uh, uh, as I do, you've got to pass those costs on somehow, uh, or you've got to collect those costs, you've got to reduce those costs in some other area of your operation. So it's a, it's a very, very serious challenge, and I, uh, I think what you'll see is on the Republican side, they're apt to try to use the market. That's at least what I've... Uh, uh, picked up reading uh, uh, the various proposals that are out there. And the Democratic side, I think you'll see more direct spending. And I think in both cases, I think they're going to get hemmed in by uh, the reality of the program. On the national security side, it's a huge challenge. Uh, you've got two things. One are budget issues. Uh, uh, nearly a, a third of the defense budget now is funded with defense supplementals. It's embedded now in their entire operation. There's uh, uh, a very expensive weapon systems uh, uh, queued up almost as far as the eye can see uh, that, that also are going to need to be funded. They've undone some of the good things, I think, that we did in the 90s to try to uh, contain the growth of, uh, of, of uh, retirement uh, pay for uh, 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 military personnel. I tend to be quite uh, uh, generous in my own thinking about that, but again, the number for the military is a growing share of their budget. Uh, so I think, first of all, you're going to have significant budget problems 
uh, they're going to be faced just trying to figure out how to sustain what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know if you read recently, there's a review being done by the Defense Department, the State Department, and NATO, which has not done, covered itself in glory, uh, uh, in my view, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, nonetheless, all three of them are doing reviews, and tucked into that is a statement by the Department of Defense that if there's a requirement for additional military forces in Afghanistan, we simply don't have the troops to be able to get the job done. You've already got deployments right now that are one year over and less than a year uh, back, which is way um, 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 uh, too much stress, in my view, uh, on the individual uh, soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. So you've already got a significant stress uh, uh, upon our military force. Uh, thus, for, for, for I'd, I'd like to say to the rest of the world, uh, who would like to see the United States of America get less involved in the rest of the world, the good news is we have a lot less capacity to do so. The bad news is we have a lot less capacity to do so because, uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 the, the people who uh, oftentimes criticize us, this is my, giving you my editorial opinion, they criticize us when they get in trouble. It's 911 USA. They're calling us uh, because we, we are the only nation that has the kind of capability to airlift and move people long distances away uh, to be able to support them with uh, good intelligence uh, collection and dissemination. We're the only nation that's got that capability, but we have significantly less capability than, than, than uh, we did, let's say, seven or eight years before, uh, ago. And I think the next president's going to face that kind of uh, reality, again, whether it's a Republican uh, or a Democratic president. Uh, now, the last thing I'd say on national security, and then I'll just stop because I'm, uh, you know, I feel like I'm on the slippery slope here now, uh, is that... Uh, uh, one of the things the next president is going to have to do, uh, and it's a tremendous challenge, is to uh, make an effort to build a bipartisan policy to deal with uh, the, this uh, real and existential threat that comes from largely radical Islamic terrorism. Uh, these groups are, are, are relatively small, but uh, uh, the, the, their size does not uh, 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 provide an indicator of the threat, the existential threat that they have to us. They consider collateral damage to be the primary objective. They've gotten very, very good as a consequence of operating in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and they remain a substantial threat both to us here in the United States as well as uh, to other democracies throughout the world. And building a, a bipartisan foreign pol a policy to deal with terrorism on the question of detention, on the question of, of, of surveillance, on the question of, of, of when do you use military force and when do you use a combination of military intel and law enforcement. Uh, that's going to be, a, I would say, uh, mission number one for the next president. Uh, we do not have a bipartisan policy today. We had it for maybe a year after 9-11, but we certainly don't have it today. Uh, and you can offer your own reasons why, and I could offer my own reasons why. It doesn't really matter what the reasons are. Uh, the fact is we're going to have to try to build that out uh, going forward. Uh, so, okay, I'm, um, I'm, I'm happily at an end of my bloviating and... We'd be glad to, if you've got questions. Yes, sir. I just wondered if you thought of any country uh, that has a health care system that we could look to to uh, try to change ours. Is there any country you look at as being really having a good system in health care that we could look to? Well, the question is, is there any country out there that's got a good health care system that we could look to? Um, you know, the problem is, it probably is, but I, this is the one I live in, and no, so I don't... <laughs> I don't. I hear people telling me that Canada is good, or Canada is terrible, or Germany is good, or Germany is terrible, and France is good, or France is terrible. I, I just, it's hard to do a comparative analysis because this is the only one I live in. Um, I don't really, you know, I, 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 I understand in my head uh, how Canada and France and Germany operate, or how, how the UK operates. Um, uh, my own, I'll give you my own opinion for what, what ought to occur over the last. You know, picking, uh, 60 years or so, there's, there's been congressional efforts to create different categories of, of individuals who will be eligible for subsidies. Because one of the things that's happened is in the United States is, as we've gotten wealthier, uh, one of the things we've decided with our wealth that we want, we want to spend a fairly significant fraction of that wealth on health. We do. I mean, we, it's, it's one of the things you get to do when, uh, the wealthier you get. You get, you, you know, you get to put more and more... Uh, resources into things that you want. And, uh, and I, I don't think, by the way, that uh, uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, so I think it's produced tremendous benefits as a, as a, as a, as a consequence. So it's actually one of the, on the, on the flip side of this thing, it's one of uh, the United States' competitive advantage right now is, is, is biotechnology and health. So it's a, it's a tremendous 
asset for us uh, 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 and source of employment, source of wealth, et cetera, in our economy. So it's not a, it, it's not a necessarily, a, a, in fact, not strike necessarily, it's not a problem to be solved. It's a, the question is, what should the federal law be uh, uh, to govern eligibility uh, for any kind of a subsidy what, whatsoever? And so we've got under federal law a number of subsidies and uh, uh, categories. And category number one is uh, if you work for the right employer, you get a tax uh, deduction, income tax and FICA offset. So, and that's fairly significant, actually. Uh, and not terribly fair that if you don't pay income tax, you don't get, I mean, I, uh, uh, I get a subsidy because my income is, is high enough that I pay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, New Yorkers, a 46% marginal rate. Uh, uh, but uh, if, if I don't pay FICA taxes, if I don't pay income taxes, uh, I don't get a subsidy. Um, so the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very unusual uh, system that people that have more income get a larger subsidy than people who have less income. It's, it's a, that's, the, that's the first subsidy, if you work for the right employer. Uh, the second one that, that, uh, the, 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 that came along is that if, you're, if you get blown up in a war, I got blown up in a war, so I, I'm eligible uh, for subsidies. My pros, prosthetics are, made, uh, uh, are paid for by the taxpayers. I, I, get, I have a claim on a little bit of all your incomes uh, uh, to, to pay for my prosthesis. Now, it's, all, it's purchased in the private sector. The government doesn't, doesn't make them for me. I go out in the private sector to buy them. But I'm eligible uh, because I can prove uh, that I was blown up in a war. The guy that's next to me that's not blown up, didn't get blown up, uh, he's not eligible. Um, uh, and actually, you could make a case that I'm the one that screwed up and got hurt, not him. So, uh, but, uh, you know, that's the law. So... Uh, that's been in place prior to Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is, as you all know, an, an eligibility based on age. Medicaid is an eligibility based to a certain extent on disability and, 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 uh, and income. Medicare actually has, a, has another one that's quite interesting, um, uh, the, the kidney dialysis program. It's quite interesting because there's no, no proof of anything other than you've got a kidney that's not working very well. Um, you like to say we've got one organ covered. Um, you know, so where there's no, it's, it's, you can say we don't reimburse enough, you've got lots of problems in the system, and there are plenty of problems in the, in the, in the renal dialysis program, but it's quite an, it's, it, it's quite an interesting program that, to examine because you, you don't have to go to Canada or France or Germany to look at it because there's no proof of eligibility. It's not means tested. Uh, it's not age tested. Uh, you're just eligible for the program, and it's... it's uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a much lower cost of a program to, to administratively to, to manage as a result. Um, so you sort of see where I'm going with this thing. I, I, and, and there's a couple of other odds and ends as well that are out there where people get subsidies based on a federal law that says they're eligible. My own pref preference uh, uh, for this thing would be if I was, if, if you were the president and, and you say to me, okay, what would you, what, uh, Bob, what, what do you recommend we do? I'd get the congressional leadership in and I'd say, look, I want you to rewrite the law on health care on, on, and, and include the VA, uh, the, the Medicare, Medicaid, the income tax deduction, put everything in the same pot. But I want Article I to be uh, that you become eligible if you can prove that you're an American citizen or you're here legally. You prove those two things, you're in a 300 million person group. Uh, and after that, uh, I don't really have any strong feelings about it. So you guys go work out the rest of the legislation and come back, and they'll come back with a mixed system. In some cases, they'll say the government should deliver all of it, probably in a better administration system. It's a pretty good system today. It's gotten better, uh, I think. Um, uh, they'll, they'll probably say in some cases the government ought to make the payment. They actually might say, uh, as Germany have done, they might say take all that uh, Medicare money and actually distribute it out to the private sector and let the private sector make payments. I mean, you could, you could end up with a system with significantly less government because the Medicare system is heavily regulated and exceptionally difficult. Well, if you said to me, do I support single payer? I would say if you could reform uh, CMS, maybe I would. Uh, but it's a very top-down and, and, and heavily regulated system and doesn't tend to encourage quality in the right ways and, and, and tends to frustrate people more than, more than it ought to. So uh, I, my own view is... Uh, after experiencing 64 years of healthcare in the United States, about 20 of it consciously, um, uh, that that you that you ought to have Title I of the federal law be uh, the, that you have that you have one large group of Americans, everybody in the same uh, system, uh, and then let the Congress figure out exactly, and let the people debate uh, what kind of mix, mixture of direct government delivery, government payment, and entirely uh, uh, private pay uh, 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 there. 
Uh, I think you've got to have, uh, the only other thing I would add to it is you, you've got to have uh, dramatically improved transparency so you can see where the payments are being made so we can, we can evaluate the quality. Uh, I do uh, 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 you know, favor uh, uh, personal health records so that I can, I can, I can know uh, what, what, what's just happened to me at the hospital so I have a capacity to examine what's going on. I think, there, I think we've removed from people over the last 60 years some connection between the cost and what's being delivered. And the more we can get back to that, even in a system that had all of us in the same thing, the more you can get back to it, the more likely it is people say, okay, now I understand why my health insurance rate rates went up. In our case, in, in our little uh, university, our health insurance went up, the rates went up because we used 120% more than premiums. And it didn't go up because the pharmaceutical companies or the insurance companies were gouging us. We used 120% of premium. And if you use 120% of premium, you're going to have a rate increase. Uh, and we used 120 because people were going to the doctor, people were going, they were getting things done. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's somehow, whatever you do, you got to, I, I would like to see us go back actually to a point where people had a, a much clearer sense of what, what things were costing than, than they do today. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Recognizing that we have two conflicts already going on, with, and regardless of who wins the next presidential election, will a future administration ever be able to, for the next 10 or 15 years to engage in another armed conflict somewhere, regardless of right or wrong? Uh, will the next administration be able to engage in an armed conflict regardless of uh, whether it's right or wrong? The answer is yes. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, I mean, I think Iraq uh, is likely to wind down to minimal involvement uh, in the United States in, I don't know, three to five years. I don't, I don't, I mean, I think the, I, I supported the war in the first place, actually, and it, it, it produced one of my uh, favorite moments as university president. Students occupied my office, um, <laughs> and I had to say to them, and I, I said, and they said, and one of them was very sweet young uh, students, said, yeah, I, 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 I I hope this doesn't upset you too much. And I said, well, I hope this doesn't upset you too much. I was in politics for 16 years, and this doesn't even make the top 50 in terms of, uh, I'm going, I said, I'm going to lunch, you know, lock up when you leave. So, uh, I, I mean, I think the occupation has been a, a big mistake, and uh, I won't go into the details of it, but I, it, it, it uh, will wind that down. You, it, it can't go on in perpetuity. Um, um, uh, so I don't, I don't know how, how quickly it winds down, but it'll, it'll wind down. But after Vietnam, there was just no capability of the United States or, or the politicians in Washington to approve uh, of an engagement. Well, have you seen Charlie Wilson's war? <laughs> um, not a bad engagement. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was a, it, you know, and you could say it like, you know, that, you know for, for the United States to be involved in a jihad as we were. Um, it, uh, we're dealing with some of the consequences of that today, but it was a fairly significant military engagement. I, I would say the answer is yes. I, I do think you're, you're, you're my, 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 I, I think we're going to fa face much larger non-military problems uh, in the world um, uh, that are going to be much more difficult to solve. I mean, climate change is, is a real thing. And you could shut off every single automobile in the United States of America and close down every power plant and you still get to 450 parts per million in, in 2050. Um, I mean, it's a huge problem uh, to solve. And, uh, and again, it, it, it deals with behavior, individual behavior. And I, I think, uh, you know, there's some real exciting possibilities coming out of it, but it's a non-military problem. And um, uh, it's not the only one uh, that sits out there as a problem. Trade has become shockingly contentious. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, there's no question that trade produces enormous economic benefits. Our problem, in my view, we just have not provided the kind of adjustment, domestic adjustment they need in health and, and, and other areas to make it work, but it's become very unpopular. Uh, and, if we, and, and I haven't got to the, the most difficult international problem right now, which is, which is the migration of human beings from one place to another. We're seeing the largest in the history of migration of human beings. Uh, the estimates by the United Nations are a billion people are going to move into communities with more than a million people in them over the next 30 years. Uh, we see it, the problem, well, we, don't, we don't debate migration, we debate immigration. And I've watched the debates of both the Republican and the Democratic Party fairly uh, carefully, and 
uh, uh, and you think, oh my God, you know, this, uh, it's, this immigration debate has gotten uh, very, very difficult. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's an international problem. It's not, a, it's not just the United States. It's a, it's a big international problem and that we're going to have to lead on in some fashion. So I, I think the larger problems that, that we face as a country are going to be non-military. Um, I will say, for, just so I understand, I, I do think the presence and the deployment of U.S. forces overseas is, can be very, very stabilizing. And I don't think we're going to pull back on that. I think we're going to have a l more limited capability of, of doing it. But um, I think we're going to... And then the last thing I'd say is that, that the hardest, perhaps the hardest military effort of all is still in this sort of murky area of dealing with um, almost entirely radical Islamic uh, groups that are, that are espousing the use of suicide uh, uh, terrorism against not just the United States but other Western democracies. Um, and there it's going to, it, it will require some military action, some law enforcement action, some intel action, but it's, it's probably, not probably, it will require um, fairly significant structural change in the law enforcement, intel, military, Community, you, you actually need a different kind of, uh, different trained and different uh, uh, capable in, individual out there than we than we've got. So I don't, I don't, but but I think you were asking me a, a question that I didn't answer. I don't, I do not believe there's going to be an Iraq syndrome hanging over us like there was uh, Vietnam syndrome because the Vietnam syndrome wasn't just Vietnam; it was Vietnam counterculture, civil rights. I mean, people were just worn out. Uh, and sixties uh, were tough. Come on. Well, you know, there, you know, it was, wasn't all bad. <laughs> yes, sir. sir. You just mentioned the word intel, and that reminds me of something that frustrates the heck out of me, and that is our intelligence in this country. What do you think of it? What do you think of the NIE uh, report? What do you think of the future of our intelligence? That'll be yours and mine. Uh, <laughs> heading down, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's it's a it's a it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I it, it, the, the question I would posit is whether or not we ever had uh, a terrific uh, uh, intel uh, uh, service, and uh, I think we've had very brave people and very capable people in there. But I think that I, I would say over the sixty-year history of the. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, as well as now 15 other intelligence agencies that have been created uh, in, the, in the community. Um, uh, it, it's, it's been very, very inconsistent. Um, I think it begins, by the way, part of the problem is that we're up against uh, people that have a lot easier time doing it. I mean, it was, a lot e it was a lot easier for the Soviet Union to collect secretly because that's what they did, that's what they did for a living, a living. So, you know, they didn't, have, they didn't have to worry about the Duma holding hearings and say that, you know, please don't go out there and do waterboarding. Um, and certainly Al-Qaeda doesn't have that. Uh, they don't have to worry about, oh, gosh, uh, you know, they're going to get called back into some sort of council and criticized for things that they're doing. I mean, they, so it's a, it's a uh, you know, we ha I, I think we've got our own values that conflict with what we want our intelligence agencies to do um, so for openers. I, 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 so I... I, I and I don't, so somebody, somebody, I hear people say our, our intelligence agencies need to be rebuilt. I don't think they need to be rebuilt. I think they need to be built. And, um, and I mean, I, you almost have to start from scratch and, and say, okay, what do we need? And what, you, what you're going to need, first of all, is you can't fall victim, as I've seen CIA directors do during the time that I was both in the Senate. I've spent eight years on, on the Intelligence Committee, six as vice chairman. It's so easy particularly for guys, to just fall in love with a clandestine service. You know, oh, God, we're going to sneak and peek and do all this. Jesus. Uh, you know, and it's a very small fraction of what we do, but, and it can get so distracting, uh, and it can lead you into bad places because it's all secret, and there's no accountability. There's accountability to the Congress in a limited way, but it's, it's, it's I don't know how many of you read Tim Weiner's book, uh, Legacy of Ashes, but it's a, it's a sad story, and, and Weiner's, I would say he's got a bit of an edge against the agencies, but he wants, he, he wants a good agency. He wants good uh, capability. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's not pretty. If you think George W. Bush is worse than John Kennedy, you're wrong uh, in terms of surveilling the American people and using covert operations in ways that you find unpleasant now that you know the facts. 
Um, I mean, that's a, it's, a, it's not a pretty story. Um, that said, I think they've added a lot of value. Um, um, so I would say the, the agencies are, are going to have to be built from the ground up. They've got to have tremendous capability to collect and analyze and disseminate intelligence. That's the first order of business before they ever get off into any clandestine effort. And there are real bad guys out there collecting and operating against us. Russia's back at it again. Yeah. Absolutely back at it again. The Iranians are at it with a vengeance. The Cubans are the, probably the best on the planet. Uh, so I mean, there's, there's people that are operating, collecting against the United States all the time uh, with hostile intent um, uh, oftentimes. I think that the NIE, my view, the second NIE is worse than the first. Um, I like that they put it out in the public so we can debate it. But, you know, it, it, the idea that Iran is not, you know, they say, well, we're, we've stopped, we don't, we're not building weapons any longer. Uh, and so that becomes the basis for the NIE saying, uh, uh, sort of, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And the, and the report has really loosened the capability of the international community to uh, put pressure on Iran to, to do these things, to, to, to stop developing highly enriched uranium and plutonium. And, and you know, they've got, a, they've got, a, they've got a, a rocket system that they're developing that has only one purpose, and that's to deliver nuclear weapons. Uh, they actually can make a case that with their capability uh, to, to refine, uh, that they may be one of the few countries on Earth that doesn't need peaceful uh, nuclear power. Sure. But uh, you know, you know, they're, they're developing, high, they've got 3,000 centrifuges and natons, they're developing plutonium, they've got a, a rocket system capable of delivering nuclear weapons. And, you know, if, if, if my, and my brother tells me today that he quits drinking, he's going to quit drinking, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say, I'm going to say, and I hope you do, but I would bet on it. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's kind of how I feel about that. So, yes? If you were a betting man, who, who do you think will be the presidential nominee for each of the two major political parties and why? And I think I know the answer to one of those, and I agree with you. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, uh, well, first of all, I am a betting man. So... Um, well, it's, on the Democratic side, I think it's going to be Hillary Clinton, um, although it definitely could be Obama. Obama has really uh, had a run here lately, and uh, he is ahead today in Iowa. It's compressed now so that the, uh, uh, it'll be very difficult for uh, Senator Clinton to recover if he wins in Iowa. Uh, and the Iowa caucuses are, uh, they have a connection to what, what the polling data show, but not, uh, it, it, you know, it's not... Uh, you know, it's not something that, that absolutely correlates, so you can't count on it. But if he wins in Iowa and then wins in New Hampshire, uh, I think he's likely to win in South Carolina and maybe Michigan as well. And uh, of a sudden, the, you've got uh, Florida on you, and he may close the gap there, although Senator Clinton's still got a big lead in Florida and a big national lead. And Obama's uh, for real right now. He's, he's back in the game in a, in a fairly substantial way. And Biden could surprise people. Edwards is not out of it either in, in Iowa. Um, and I would say if you're looking for a surprise in Iowa, it's probably going to be Biden. But if you're looking for Biden to be the nominee, that would, that, that, I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, even though on paper, he's probably the best candidate out there right now. Um, on the Republican side, God, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, I, uh, it looked, I mean uh, uh, two weeks ago, it looked like Romney. And... Uh, today, it, 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 on, on, on paper, uh, it looks like it's possible that Huckabee could get it. Uh, I can't, it's hard to imagine that happening. Uh, but it, 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 and, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's some analysis uh, uh, that's been putting out lately that on the Republican side, it might not be over on the 5th of February um, because the, the, the larger states, I think, you know, the, the, the strategy of Rudy Giuliani to try to build up support in Florida, for example, which is the 29th of January, that's a lot of delegates. All he has to do is win Florida. He can lose every. He can lose Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Michigan. Lose all that, and then on, on Florida, he wins Florida. He'll be the, he'll be number one in terms of total number of delegates. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard this wonderful statement of Sam Rayburn. He said, "In politics, there's two kinds of people: those who can count and those who lose." So um, everybody knows on the electoral college, you need 270 electoral votes. Yeah, and, and when you're going to the convention, you need about 2,300, 2,320. I don't know what the numbers are today, but you need to get a majority of the delegates to the convention. 
and there are no power brokers anymore. They're going to they're decide who it is. You, you've got to get a majority. And uh, I would say that Hillary's got the lead because she's got a lot of superdelegates. These are elected officials largely who are, are selected. And uh, she'll, have a, a, uh, she'll go to the convention with, with the likelihood that she either has a majority or pretty close to it. But I think Obama's going to come to the convention with, with delegates. He may, as I said, he may win. Uh, I think Edwards will probably come with some delegates. Uh, Biden will probably come with some delegates. Uh, and the Republican side, uh, if I'm looking at who, who's going to amass the delegates, it's very difficult to figure that out today. And it, you know, M- M- McCain is making an, an, another run at this thing. Um, uh, I think that he's, you know, if he gets, if he gets a strong second uh, uh, in New Hampshire, uh, he's back in the game. And if he gets first in New Hampshire, uh, uh, he could be the Republican nominee. So. But I'll stick with my on the Republican side. I really it's hard to figure it out. Yes, sir. In view of, the, of your earlier remarks, uh, is there any movement in Congress to increase it? Excuse me, a two-year uh, term or an increased two-year term? Uh, the, the House of Representatives? Yeah. No. No. Uh, I mean, to have a constitutional amendment to increase it from two to four or something like that? No. Uh, never heard. Uh, uh, you think it's a good idea? <laughs> I wouldn't think so. What you said, but, uh, oh, no, God. I mean, look, every, every job's got pluses and minuses. And so, you know, I, I, uh, one of the things my dad gave me is, a, you know, don't complain about the job till it's done. So, you know, <laughs> Members of Congress complain all the time. It's hard. You got to fundraise all the time. He's like, "Yeah, come on, Jesus, still, you know." Uh, I mean, you take that complaint on the road, it doesn't go very far. So, um, and I, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't lengthen the term um, for for the House. Senator, one of the issues that it strikes me, and we've been living increasingly with over the recent years at all levels of the government, is that thing called polarization. Those people are in cement over there, and those people are in cement over there. And the two don't want to lessen, break up the cement and find a way to get out there. How do we change or attack this problem if that's real? Well, well I, I, I think it is real. Um, uh, it's, 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 you know, we cause it. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's it's the people that are that are that that produce it and um, and you just I don't, I don't know what to do about it frankly I'm, but, but first of all uh, the, the the great polarization moment in the history of this country was uh, probably the 1800 election um, when uh, uh, I mean my God the, the things that were being said about Aaron Burr and the things that were being said by Thomas Jefferson uh, I mean it's it's hard to find negative comments today that are as, that are as nasty as what was being said in pamphlets about both those two guys. And Hamilton goes down to, to Congress with 35 votes in the House. Hamilton was the same party as Burr and thought he didn't have the character to be President of the United States, so he campaigned in the House, and on the 36th vote, they went for Jefferson, uh, with whom he disagreed on every issue. And as you know, a few years later, uh, Burr killed him. So, uh, doesn't get any worse than that. So, <laughs> you know, that's, you talk about polarized, man, that was, so uh, I don't know. I mean, part, I mean, what, what's, what's happened that bothers me is that it's, it's not the polarization. I like a good, intense debate. I mean, I, I think that's good. I mean, you ought, the only time we quit arguing was 1861 to 65. Uh, so I like uh, debates, and the presence of a debate, and people ferociously argue, even calling each other names, especially if it's d- directly uh, at them, um, is a good thing. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. What bothers me is on the difficult issues, uh, health care, entitlements, immigration, trade, um, it's a, cr- a, lo- a crime, um, uh, it's so easy uh, to take something that you've said uh, and put it out there in a negative way and cause you to lose a close election, uh, whether it's with a blog. The blog can be wonderfully liberating because they basically lowered the, uh, the cost of entry to become a publisher. 
You don't, you don't need $100 million to be the New York Times. You just start a blog. You can be Arianna Huffington or Matt Drudge or something. And the next thing, next thing you know, that, and people go to both, both those blogs in the morning uh, to find out what's going on. So um, the cost of entry has gone down, but the intimidation factor has gone up. And on, on the tough issues, as I said, you, know, it, it, for, it, you should not, on uh, one hand, say, gee, I wish uh, our political leaders would be willing to stand up and quit doing political polls all the time, which they just tell us what they think rather than what's, what they think is going to be popular. But uh, they're trying to win an election. And what I worry about and, and is not so much the polarization, but the use of highly targeted campaigns using technology uh, to produce fear uh, in the hearts of these political representatives so they don't tackle the contentious issues. And you can hear it in their answers to questions. I, I pay attention enough to know when they're, when they're pulling their punches, when they're not being honest. I haven't heard an honest answer, for example, on health care. Uh, uh, and the reason is, you, you know, you, you can't get from where we are to where we're going to be without somebody taking a little bit less or paying a little bit more. There's no way to fix the problem any other way. You got to pay more and take less. I mean, you just get, and, and all in favor of that say aye. You get, uh, you know, it's it's tough to it's tough to do. So th that's what I worry about. I worry that the polarization is reducing uh, our capacity of, of the capacity of self government to make difficult decisions. Yes. So on the issue of the healthcare debate, do you think that the um, the objections to more accessible or universal healthcare primarily from the Republicans are somewhat disingenuous, given their <coughs> health care uh, benefits as members of Congress, and then taking it a step further to, uh, to benefits available to veterans like yourself, where the health care is not only delivered by a government employee, but uh, done so in a government-owned facility? Yes. Um, <laughs> <and> a word? <laughs> I mean, so... Uh, no, I mean, hypocrisy is alive and well in America. I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, no, I, I, yeah, I think uh, we, look, we had a, a panel discussion on health care recently at the, at the New School. And uh, Ron Wyden uh, was there and Bob Bennett. They, were, they, they, they co sponsor a piece of legislation. That, and uh, there was a number of other uh, 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 people there. Richard Burr, uh, Republican senator from uh, North Carolina, was there. And uh, Coburn the new Republican senator from Oklahoma, um, uh, who is a piece of work. Uh, uh, I mean, he's smart as a whip. Uh, and so we had this debate. And Burr's argument was, uh, you can't have more government involvement because more government involvement is going to reduce choice, and what we need is more competition in the marketplace, et cetera. And then later on, he's, he starts talking about uh, Part C, that one of the great accomplishments of the Republican Party under the prescription benefit is that it's increased competition uh, uh, in the private sector. And so, Richard, how's it possible? How's it possible that a government program increased competition? Because um, you just said the government program decreases competition in all cases. And uh, the answer is it's, it's, it is possible uh, for a government program to actually increase competition. Uh, uh, you know, you're, so, yeah, I would say you know, listen to the debate, you would never know that 60 cents on the dollar is paid right now with taxes. You would never get that from the debate. I remember in, 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 in Nebraska campaign, you know, a great moment during the big health care debates of 93 and 94, I had a, a, a woman just flailing at me in an airport uh, against socialized medicine. And so when it, she calmed down a bit, I asked where she worked. She worked at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I said, Jesus, you work for the government. Uh, no, no, it's private. Are you kidding me? It's a, it's a university hospital. What, that's the first word. University of Nebraska Medical Center. It's not, you know, this is not a market-based system that you work in. Um, uh, you know, it, it, and at the same time, I think on the Democratic side, uh, uh, we, we put uh, too little uh, stock in the difficulty that people have with CMS and with Medicare. Uh, it is a heavily regulated system that tends to discourage innovation. So... Um, and tend to, I, I think, underestimate the difficulty of getting where we are, are today to, uh, to a universal system. I, 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 one more, I mean, I, I actually have a great deal of difficulty with programs that are, are going to fill the gaps, d decrease the number of uninsured, for example. I mean, I, I just, I, it's going to be a lot more money. 
And I don't, I, uh, my guess is you could put a lot more money in the system and the number of uninsured is going to go back up. That's why my, I believe that unless and until the federal law says that you have one 300 million person group and we all got to live by the same rules. Um, and that's how you, all you got to do is prove that you're a citizen or you're here legally. You prove those two things. And there'll be people arguing that, that we ought to take care of undocumented as well. Let them make that argument. But if, if that's the group, uh, and we all got to live by the same rules, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult, it seems to me, for us not to develop, uh, for the first time, a U.S. health care system. I don't think we have a system today. I think we have outstanding health care at the high end, but I don't think we have a system. Uh, it's very difficult for us to do the sorts of things that everybody talks about. We want to put more money in prevention. We want to decrease the administrative costs. We want to do this, that. Very difficult to do that today in a system where, where so much of it is just mandated. I mean, that Medicare money just goes out, and that Medicaid money just goes out. It just, it's just year after year after year, and uh, you, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can make change at the margin, but you really can't make change in the way that I think change is going to be needed if you're going to take advantage of the great intellectual power and capability we have in this space. Can I just interrupt just for a public service announcement? Um, for those of you who need to get to the train station, there will be a Concordia van in the front oval out of, by White Plains Road if you need to... Uh, if you need to leave and get going. So feel free to leave quietly on your way out, and then uh, Senator will leave it, get back to you with a Q&A in another 15, 20 minutes, if that works. Well. Sure, whatever works for all of you, I can. Yes, sir. How do you feel about the draft versus a more universal military service for young people over the long term? For the well, Not so much today, I, but it does for today, but just the longer term, generational to generation. All these guys that are eligible for the draft are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I, look, I think, I think the draft would be good for the country, and right now I'm not sure it's good for the military. I think the all-volunteer force has been, been very good for the military. But it does, it does put the military further and further away from, from society, and I think that's a problem. And uh, it, it, it does make war power resolutions a lot less serious than they might be if, if, if you had more members of Congress and they're saying, my kid's going to go. So... Um, and I, I think it does, there, there is something about having served in something that, that you know, it's, it's not, I didn't serve in the Navy, I served in the U.S. Navy. And there's something about that that uh, uh, teaches you things that are, that are important. So I would say good for the country. Uh, I'm not so sure it's good for the military. But uh, I'm intrigued by it. I'm increasing. It's expensive as heck to do. It's not a cheap thing to do. Uh, and you could certainly make it universal without necessarily having to have everybody in the military. You could do some other kinds of service. But, boy, I think it adds a lot of value to the country. And I, I really am troubled by the, by the distance that there is today between uh, our military and the rest of society, both in terms of what's required of both groups and, um, and just the, the, the language, the culture, et cetera. I mean, there's far too, people, far too few people in America and far too few people and a diminishing number, actually, in the Congress that have ever served in the military and have no experience with it, no understanding of it, no idea what it means. To your understanding, when, when you were senator and now, was the discussion following up on the draft issue of a year or two of service to the country? Well, we did. I mean, we created a national service program, but the problem, problem is we... we, we I mean, and I think it's actually worked. Uh, uh, full disclosure, I voted against it the first time because I, I, I was troubled with this idea that we've got to kind of bribe people to get in by giving them stipends and scholarships and so forth. Uh, I think it's really worked out quite well. But it's not the same thing as, as you hit 18 and you've got you to serve. Uh, um, I think there's conversations about it. The problem is, as I said, it's very expensive. It's, you're talking 3.5 million people a year. And it's, it'd be hard for me to imagine getting in and out of the thing without $25,000, $30,000 a year in expenditures. So it gets to be a big number in a hurry. Um, the other thing I'd say on that point is that I think we do a lousy job of preparing a young man and woman for that moment at age 18 when they become a citizen. Uh, I, I do not think our K-12 system does anywhere near as good a job as they need to. And maybe it's not the K-12. Maybe it needs to be done in this middle space between... Uh, government and the, and the private sector, but um, you know, I, 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 I've got very strong feelings on, on, on reforming the presidential election. I think it's, it's, 
Uh, I mean, I've had enough of state parties, state legislatures determining the terms and conditions of the presidential election. I mean, let them decide the rules of governing an election for governor and senator, but when we're electing the person that's going to be president of the United States, it needs to be a federal system. Um, and tucked in that idea is always, every, every time there's one of these stories comes out about uh, uh, high school students and uh, how, what, a, what a low fraction of them know what the three branches of the government are and all, you know, you, you know, how come they don't know the history of the country and so, and, and, and there's the pundits <clears throat> are talking about how ignorant uh, American kids are. And I sort of thought it would be kind of nice to put together a 50 question test for the 535 members of Congress. And, and see how well they do, you know, see, see whether they know uh, the, uh, enough to uh, pass a citizenship test as well. I mean, there's a, re a recent story about that. It's now called ICE that uh, uh, used to be Immigration Naturalization uh, uh, Service, but they, they put together a test for citizenship. And the test for citizenship is quite interesting. You, you, one of the questions is, name two Supreme Court justices. And the... the uh, the story that I read, they went out and polled Americans, and 22% of Americans could name two Supreme Court justices. 78 could name two of the seven dwarfs. So, uh, you know, uh, and, but there's, you know, you don't have to go very far to, to get very concerned about our capacity to govern ourselves. It's back to the question of how vulnerable we are to polarizing blogs and polarizing emails, etc., uh, when, we, when, when we don't know enough to be able to make these fundamental decisions. So, Are you trying to do that in the new school? Are you trying to do that kind of citizenship? Well, you can do it, but we're doing it at the margin. We're doing it after yeah. somebody's graduated from high school. And uh, yes, I would, uh, 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 the, you know, the whole idea of college, of course, is, a, is, is you know, that, at its heart is a liberal arts education where the whole effort is to try to increase the knowledge and understanding capability of making good decisions and good choices in your life. So I'd say that we are. But it's at the margin. I would be, I'd feel better if uh, coming into my college were, were kids that, that, that really understood the, uh, the, the ideas that under, underlie democracy, that had the capacity to, to communicate effectively, et cetera. I'd, I'd be, feel a lot better if, if, if I didn't have to do so much remedial work. Yes? In light of uh, some recent disclosures, do you think the 9-11 Commission was given all the information it requested? No. No. I mean, first of all, we were, it, well, un, under law, we had a limited amount of time to do our work. So, uh, and we actually requested and were turned down the authority to extend beyond the presidential election. Now, you could go on forever and, uh, and never get it done. Uh, but, and, and secondly, there, there was a substantial amount of understandable but still very real friction that made the work difficult. I mean, I, when I said yes to it, uh, I was in my second year. And it, you know, I was just, we had 9-11 and we, you know, it, it was a, it was a rocky uh, year and a half, a recession and so forth. I mean, there was plenty of reasons for me to say no. And I said, well, I, I was on the intelligence committee. I know a fair amount about this. I know who bin Laden is. I knew, Cal I, I knew enough that I could, I thought, well, this isn't going to be that hard. Uh, but it turned out to be absolutely wrong. There were five locations where documents were held. And you had to go to those locations to read the documents. And when you made notes, you couldn't take the notes out. So you had to go back, uh, if you were trying to prepare questions for witness, you had to go back to that location to look at your notes to write the questions. And then you had to take it to the, to the, to the guard to make sure that none of the questions were classified going out. So it was just not, it was really, really difficult to do the work uh, because so much of it is classified. It's actually caused me to conclude that we ought to have something comparable to a permanent 9-11 commission with people that, that do this full time and then issue both classified and unclassified reports uh, talking about the, the distance between where we are and where we need to be in terms of, of security. It's a, there's so much political motivation to give the wrong answer that, and, and so much of it is classified. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I mean, there, there's, there's a number of areas where we simply didn't have time or resources to complete the work. Uh, the, 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 the one that's been in the news lately uh, is that we requested uh, uh, the opportunity to, to interview uh, 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 Amir uh, Zubadaya and uh, Kayla Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, there were, you know, Kayla Sheikh Mohammed was the ringleader. He was the one who planned uh, the attacks. He, uh, his nephew, Ramzi Yusuf, carried out the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. And so, and so he was a 
but a mildly, a very important part of the narrative. And all we knew is that, that we had him somewhere and he was being detained somewhere. And so we said, well, we've, uh, on our staff, we had a, 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 a guy by the name of Dieter Snell, uh, who was, a, was uh, in the team that prosecuted Ramsey Youssef in 1993. So he knew a lot about it. And he knew how to take evidence. And so we said, we want him to go over. And they said, absolutely not. Uh, you cannot interview him. Well, that makes it hard. So they said, if you'll just prepare questions, we'll, we'll take them to Kayla Sheikh Mohammed's and Badiah, and we'll give, them, we'll give you the answers. Well, uh, that's the best we could get. Uh, we could go to court over it, but the commission ran out of time. They, we, every time it, it was, do I subpoena the documents? Do I subpoena the witness? Do I subpoena uh, uh, something that we needed? You had to measure that against how, much, how long does it take to litigate this? And if we thought that we could win with public opinion, we would try to win with public opinion and get the administration to, to do these things. But on this one, they wouldn't do it. And I'm left with a little bit of concern that, about that portion of the narrative since Kata Sheikh Mohammed now has copped a plea to every damn crime on the, that's happened all the way back to Cain slaying Abel. So, uh, uh, and, you know, so I, don't, I, don't, I have concerns about the reliability of that. There, there, are other, there are other areas. The Iranian involvement was substantial. The Saudi Arabian involvement was substantial. Um, I mean, there's nothing that we could really do about it, but, uh, you know, the, the, the two plane loads that left right after 9-11 of, 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 of Saudi nationals uh, without being interviewed or, uh, or, or without getting some kind of uh, information from them substantially reduced the base of knowledge that we had to produce a report. That said, I do think we had the narrative pretty, pretty, pretty well. I mean, I don't, it's, I don't believe for a minute that it was an inside government job. Uh, uh, Israel didn't do it. Uh, I mean, it was, we, there, there's an organization called Al-Qaeda. They started in the early 1990s. They declared the United States of America the enemy, the head of the snake, and they began to carry out a series of attacks against us. Uh, that narrative is undeniably true. Um, um, and it's also undeniably true that we thought the attack was going to occur elsewhere. As long as it was overseas in Aden, as long as it was in, the, in Dar es Salaam in Nairobi, as long as it was over there, we just didn't believe it was going to happen here, even though we had a substantial amount of evidence that we were at considerable risk. Senator, could you comment on the uh, farm bill? The farm bill? <laughs> <laughs> the farm bill. Um, well, uh, actually, I can't. I don't know what's in it. I know they passed it finally. I don't know what's in it. So, well, what do you think about uh, reduction of subsidies? You're from Nebraska, so you should feel something about that. Well, I, I, uh, I would prefer to go to, to strengthen the risk-based uh, crop insurance program that we have and decrease the amount of subsidies that are being provided. And any payments we make, I'd prefer them to be made up to encourage uh, these private landowners, a farmer, uh, to do soil and water conservation, um, particularly soil conservation. I think it's a... Well, the farm bill that they're trying to evolve now is to, to really reinforce the smaller farm. So what do you think? Do you think we can bring back small farms and no. make them productive? No. No. Right, so. no. I mean, it's... Can I bring back mom and pop businesses on Main Street? I mean, uh, no, I don't... I mean, I think that you can put the payments out there in a way that make it easier for you know, relatively small farmers survive. But, you, you know, you go to a, take a 1,000-acre farm in, in uh, central Nebraska, and most people think that's a big farm. It doesn't generate as much revenue as an average McDonald's restaurant. So, um, no, I mean, I, I, I don't think you can. I think you've got a, you, you, you got a, you, you've got a, you've got a way of life that needs to be preserved. I think the, that, that family-based agriculture produces tremendous things that people, most importantly, and that because they produce the, the product that, that they're producing is produced out of doors, they're at considerable risk. So I, I, I would favor strengthening the risk-based uh, uh, crop insurance program. And because, I don't know, 80% of all the soil conservation is done on private land, uh, I'd put more money out there for soil and water conservation. Sort of, not, not, not just green payments, but just to increase the conservation effort that, we've, that, that has been quite a miracle over the last, you know, since the Dust Bowl, since uh, we began to... Uh, you know, notice that soil is a finite resource. Thank you. We said okay. that we were quite at the quarter to nine, and I want to respect everybody's uh, time commitment first and foremost. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming today. Uh,
presentations. I wanted to make sure you all were aware of the uh, next presentations that we will have on January 15th. Don Gogal, Bronxville resident, who is uh, president and CEO of Clayton Duvalier, private equity firm, will be speaking on the topic of the credit uh, market meltdown. Uh, March 11th, Leo Hindry, uh, known as a founder and chairman of the Yes Network, will be here uh, talking about reforming U.S. foreign aid and economic impact on global poverty. He's vice chair for the Council on Foreign Relations Help Commission. And on April 8th, John Hill, another Bronxville resident who is vice chairman and managing director of First Reserve Corporation and chair of the Putnam Funds, will be speaking about the energy market outlook and trends. So check your mail for the invitations. If you did not receive an invitation in the mail, please be sure to give either myself Cheryl Donner or VG, your business card, we'll make sure we include you on our mailing list. So again, thanks so much for coming, and thanks again, Senator. Yep. Thank you. That was great. Thanks.